Hey everybody, we are in the exciting season of fall. This truly is an epic time of the year. Fall means the end of the growing season with lots of food for creatures like berries, nuts, and fruits. It means changing weather patterns with crisp air, windy days, and fall rains. It means wildlife is a lot more busy and birds are taking long journeys south. Fall is when you can see geese honking high above you, hear elk bugling down in the valley, watch sandhill cranes land in the wetlands at dusk, and spot many birds of prey on the move across the sky. Fall is a time of plenty to eat, lots to do, and places to go. It's a season to think about the importance of God's guidance as we see so much change and travel going on in nature. It's a time of energy and excitement with lots to experience. So I hope you're ready for an adventure. Here we go. As a wildlife filmmaker and educator, I've spent most of my life exploring God's creation. From discovering epic ice caves, to kayaking on gorgeous lakes, and hiking into forests, my love of God's creation has taken me on many outdoor adventures. In each of these episodes, you'll come along with me through the seasonal year as we explore the world that God has given us. I hope you're ready for an adventure. I'm Peter Schremer, and this is Hike and Seek. Fall is a season of transition. Summer was a time of growing, of warm days, and lots of daylight. Winter will be when nighttime comes early with cold days and less food. Right now, fall is a season when everything is in a constant state of transition, and these big changes affect everything in the natural world. Many animals and birds are done raising their young, plants and trees are done growing, and all of nature is preparing for a period of time when creation rests from the growing season. During this time of preparation, God's world produces extra amounts of food in nature to give animals the energy they need to go through the big changes. Animals have three different options in the fall. With winter bringing freezing cold temperatures and very limited food options, animals can forage looking for ways to survive and what food is available in the winter. They can hibernate or sleep through the winter months until spring, or they can migrate, which means leaving the north and heading south where they can find more food and warmer temperatures until spring returns. The extra food in nature that is produced in the fall is very important to animals and birds that travel or migrate at this time of year. Just like you and me, we need healthy foods to give us energy to stay active. God provides that for wildlife with lots of great energy foods to keep them going on their journeys. Today, we're going to meet some amazing migrating creatures and go on a journey of our own through this incredible season of change. You know it's migration season when you hear geese honking high and flying in that V formation across the sky. You'll notice that the one side of the V is longer than the other. That's because there are more geese on that side. The real reason geese fly in that V shape is for a couple of different benefits. First, it saves a lot of energy on their long journeys. The lead goose works the hardest, breaking through any wind resistance. This creates a low pressure area behind the lead goose, which makes it easier to fly for all the geese following behind. Each bird flies slightly above the goose in front of it to take advantage of this low pressure area and save energy. As the lead goose gets tired, it drops on back down the line and another goose takes a turn leading up front. By working together like this and taking turns, geese save a lot of energy, which allows them to go further distances when they migrate. One study showed that by flying in that V formation, geese can increase how far they travel up to 70%. That's a big win for teamwork. The second reason geese fly in that V formation is to help them see and keep track of where everyone is in the group. That allows them to avoid flying into each other by accident and to communicate better with one another while in flight. Canada geese are part of the duck kind and are the most familiar and commonly seen geese throughout North America. 
The males, called ganders, can weigh up to 14 pounds and have a five-foot wingspan. They have webbed feet for swimming and spend most of their time in bodies of water, like lakes and ponds, where they can find aquatic plants and small aquatic creatures to eat. They also eat grasses and grains found in fields and meadows. Though they're very common today, that was not always the case. Overhunting made certain populations go nearly extinct, along with other species of ducks and waterfowl. But thankfully, there were people who cared about the geese and the water birds. And one of those people was a man named Jack Miner. Jack was born in Ohio in 1865, the day after the Civil War ended. After he turned 13 years old, his family moved to Ontario, Canada, where he lived the rest of his life. He had a passion for wildlife, and he started digging small lakes and ponds in 1904 to provide places for geese and ducks to stop at on their migration. In just a few years, the numbers of geese stopping by grew from 11 birds to over 400. Jack Miner wanted to learn where the birds flew and what routes they took. So he started putting little metal bands on some of their legs. He put his contact information on them, so when someone found one of them, they'd return it to him, and he'd learn how far the bird had flown and where it went. So this is what an actual goose band looks like. And this over here is one of Jack Miner's original bands, all flattened out so that you can read it. Now, Jack didn't just put his information on his bands, he also put Bible verses. He said that the idea was like a message from God, and that the birds that'd be carrying these Bible verses were like missionaries of the air, spreading God's word around the continent. The dedicated work of Jack Miner and others led to a much greater understanding about where waterfowl and other types of birds fly every year. North America is a very large continent, and so birds don't all take the same routes when they fly north and south. We've learned that depending on where a bird lives in North America, they take one of four different routes that we call flyways. There is the Pacific Flyway along the Pacific Ocean coastline the Central Flyway straight through the Great Plains, the Mississippi Flyway that includes the Great Lakes and on down the Mississippi River, and the Atlantic Flyway that travels along the coastline of the Atlantic Ocean. Our fall adventure today is in the Mississippi Flyway. Birds and other animals that migrate don't all travel at the same time. Hummingbirds and some shorebirds can start migrating as early as July, but most early migrators are seen on their travels in August. Songbirds and birds of prey reach their peak migration in September and October, and golden eagles can be seen migrating as late as November. Birds aren't the only animals that migrate or travel in the fall. Monarch butterflies are famous for their fall migration, traveling over 3,000 miles from southern Canada all the way down into Mexico. And most people don't know this, but the green darner dragonfly, the largest dragonfly in North America, has a similar migration of 900 miles in the eastern United States. There are mammals that migrate in North America too, like the one we're gonna meet next. We're here at the Amber Elk Ranch near Ludington, Michigan to get the rare opportunity in this part of the country to see some elk up close. Elk were once the most common hoofed mammal across North America, numbering possibly up to 10 million. But overhunting long ago significantly reduced their numbers and completely eliminated them from certain parts of the country. Today, elk have been reintroduced to Michigan but spotting one is a rare sight. But at the Amber Elk Ranch, you don't have to look hard. They take you right out to them. The ranch has a herd of 160 elk on the property. Staying on the wagon here allows us to get really close. If I was to step off the wagon, they'd see me as a person and a threat. But staying on the wagon, they don't care at all. Elk are part of the deer kind and are ungulates, which means they have hooves instead of feet and toes. They are big mammals. Some males, called bulls, can get eight feet long, stand five feet at the shoulder, and reach over 700 pounds. They are very social and love to hang out in groups, called gangs. 
They are herbivores, eating grasses, leaves, shrubs, and trees. Bulls grow a new set of antlers every single year. They fall off naturally in the winter, start growing again in the spring, and look like this by early fall. Elk antlers are one of the fastest growing bones in the animal world. In just about seven months, antlers can grow to be five feet long and weigh almost 70 pounds. During the summertime, they can grow as much as an inch a day. Antlers are a display of an elk's health and dominance. Being social animals, they are very vocal and make all kinds of sounds to communicate with each other. They can bugle, grunt, and bark to each other. In mountainous habitats out west, like in Yellowstone National Park, elk migrate down from the mountains to valleys and lowlands where they can avoid the harsher winter weather and more easily find softer snow and food under it. Elk herds, numbering in the hundreds, will travel 50 to 100 miles on their migration in the fall. For people who live near elk herds, the sound of a bull elk bugling across the hills and valleys means that fall is here. With all kinds of creatures migrating and moving around at this time of year, fall is a perfect season for us to travel too. Whether you're going on a trip or just getting out in nature near your home, this is a great time of year to be outside. Cool, crisp air, beautiful scenery, and lots of animal activity you can spot. But it's important to remember what to wear and what to bring with you on your travels. This season of transition means the temperature is transitioning too. And you can have a cold morning, a warm afternoon, and a cool evening all in the same day. So it's best to layer for the weather. This allows you to adjust with the temperature. Since it can be windy or rainy, a good water repellent jacket is often a great option. Don't forget to wear comfortable pants and shoes or boots to protect your feet and give you some grip. For your backpack, bring snacks to give you energy on your journey and make sure that you have enough water for your hike. When your water's half gone, your hike's half over. Bring your Bible for time in God's Word, your nature journal for writing and drawing about your travels, a compass to help you find your way, and some binoculars for bird watching and spotting other wildlife. These are gonna come in really handy where we're headed to next. During the month of October, along the Mississippi Flyway, Sandhill cranes in the north form into flocks as they begin their long journey south toward Florida. During the fall, you can spot sandhill cranes resting in farm fields or meadows or flying high overhead in small groups. But the best way to experience their migration in action is at dusk, which is why we're here at Big Marsh Lake near Battle Creek, Michigan, because it's an important staging area where thousands of sandhill cranes fly into the marsh here at night to rest. Sandhill cranes are part of the crane kind and are very large birds, standing up to four feet tall and having a wingspan of over six feet. Second only to the endangered whooping crane, sandhill cranes are one of the largest birds in North America. In flight, you can tell if it's a crane by the silhouette. Cranes fly with their legs out behind them and their necks stretched out in front of them. Herons and egrets fly with their feet behind them, but their necks are tucked back onto their bodies. Geese and swans have their long necks out in front, but their shorter legs are tucked up against their bodies. So to identify some of these birds in flight, look for their neck and their legs. But even if you can't see them clearly, their unique call gives them away. They can be very loud and you can hear them from a long way off, but using your binoculars will help give you a closer look. During migration, sandhill cranes can travel more than 200 miles a day and fly up to 35 miles an hour. Most of their diet is plant material, which is why you'll see them in fields and meadows and wetlands like this one here. Marshes are also where they nest in the spring because it keeps them safe from predators and provides lots of food. This also means that marshes make great places to gather and rest during migration.
So to meet some unique migrating birds, we are here at the Howell Nature Center. And up first, we have Caitlin Lewis and the ever beautiful turkey vulture. So before we get into the aspects of their migration, why are they called turkey vultures? So Igor here and turkey vultures, they're named first of all for just the way that they look. So he looks a lot like a wild turkey with that dark colored body and that pink head. Uh, but also vultures and buzzards in general, they are uh, species that feed on dead things. So turkey and vulture together, you get an Igor. So they are really good at finding their food in a way that sets them apart from other birds. Tell us a little bit about that. So while he has gorgeous eyes on his little face here, um, that's not what he's finding food with. He's finding food with that not as cute nose right there. So that nostril that goes all the way through is very, very good at processing smells around him. And he can smell dead food, uh, which is his favorite, uh, from about a mile away. So that little nose does lots of work for him. So turkey vultures are a great example of animals adapting to live in the world after death came as a result of Adam and Eve sinning against God. They have a very important role in cleaning things up in nature. So tell us a little bit about that. Their Latin name actually translates to cleansing breeze, so catharsis aura. The turkey vulture acts as nature's cleanup crew. They're able to follow along after an animal has passed away and consume all of those remnant parts. So their stomach acid is about akin to hydrochloric acid. It can destroy things like botulism, anthrax, and it won't pass through them. They no longer are a vector then for that disease to continue. So it is ending at this beautiful turkey vulture. So turkey vultures are pretty amazing birds. What are some other crazy facts about them? They are experts at defending themselves. So that hooked beak bites really hard. Uh, on top of that, they're able to vomit at anything that's potentially coming after them. So if you're loading yourself up on one carcass and you need to take off from a predator coming at you and you've got a six foot wingspan, you're weighing in at three to four pounds, you've got to empty that uh, tank real quick to get away. So throwing up helps them to get further away from a potential threat. They will cool themselves by urinating on their own feet, which is a fun but gross fact. If you can't sweat, you've got to come up with all kinds of creative ways to cool yourself off. That's one of a turkey vulture's secret weapons. Uh, and in addition to that, um, these guys are really designed for great body language communication, but they are silently and stoic, just like Igor right now, in their way of being verbal. They don't have a voice box like us. They don't have a larynx. They don't even have a syrinx like other birds. These guys, they grunt, they breathe heavily out those big nostrils, and that's about all they can do for the noises that they can make. Um, and everything else is relying on the way that they hold their feathers, the way that they change their uh, pupil shape, so they'll shrink and, and widen it so they express things. They'll even tap their feet to threaten another turkey vulture that this is my dinner and I'm not sharing with you. So turkey vultures have some unique aspects to their migration. What are some ways that set them apart from other migrating birds? Uh, well, their biggest feature is these guys have a flex fuel engine. So they can actually ride hot air currents up into the sky and then float, kind of glide their way down to the next one. So you're traveling at up to 20,000 feet above the earth. Uh, you can go a couple hundred miles in a day on a turkey vulture engine as well as you don't even have to stop for food. You're not burning any energy. So these guys frequently don't even eat when they're migrating. They're gonna go just on and on and on down south to stay warm for the winter. How animals navigate or find their way as they migrate has been somewhat of a mystery. Even though we've learned a lot about migration, we still don't know how it works exactly in all instances. What we do know is that not all animals find their way doing the same things. Some creatures use the position of the sun by day and the moon and the stars at night to find their way. It's kind of like using a map to know which direction to go. Other animals use landmarks, like following coastlines or rivers as they travel. Sometimes even scent is involved and a creature's ability to smell helps them return to a familiar area. There are also instances where parents teach their young where to go and when they grow up, they use their memory. One of the coolest ways that some birds and animals migrate is with their own compass. You see, Earth has an invisible magnetic field around it coming from the North Pole and the South Pole. We can't see it, but some animals can sense it, and that allows them to know which way is north or south. And just like a compass that reacts to the Earth's magnetic field and always points north, some creatures have an internal compass in their brain that senses the magnetic field and allows them to know which way to go. 
Scientists aren't exactly sure how this works, but some animals have a magnetic mineral in their brain called magnetite that may help orient the animal in the right direction. The way God guides his creation through his design and the ability of animals to adapt is truly incredible. One of the greatest displays of migration in the fall comes from birds of prey. Hundreds of thousands of hawks, eagles, and falcons migrate every fall and again in the spring. Like turkey vultures, they save a lot of energy by using updrafts of air called thermals that help them soar without needing to flap their wings hardly at all. Many birds of prey, like hawks, migrate in large groups called kettles because the circling motion of their soaring in a thermal looks kind of like they're being stirred in a kettle. Some birds of prey, like the broad-winged hawk, are incredible soaring migrators, traveling more than 4,300 miles on their way south. Unlike these birds of prey, most owls stay in their home range throughout the year and don't migrate. But there are some species that do small migrations when lack of food or harsh weather in the north push owls a little bit further south. Birders call these migrations eruptions because certain areas seem to erupt suddenly with owls. Some of the species of owls that do this are the snowy owl, the great horned owl, and the short-eared owl. So there are different seasons when animals migrate, and there are different ways that they navigate, but there are also different reasons why they migrate. Sometimes the reason to travel is so that an animal can find a better location to lay eggs or give birth and raise their young. Colder temperatures and snow definitely affect some species too, but most often the main reason to travel has to do with finding enough food. As plants and trees stop growing and go into a dormant state, cold temperatures freeze the ground and snow covers everything. Many food sources for wildlife are either gone or very limited, which is why so many birds and other creatures migrate to find places further south where they can get enough food. The way birds and animals know when to migrate is quite amazing. The changing temperatures and the shift in food supply can influence the timing, but there's something even more incredible going on underneath. The Earth orbits around the sun completely every year. It spins as it orbits, which gives us day and night. The Earth orbits on an axis, which means during the summer months, the northern hemisphere, where we are, is tilted towards the sun, and we have long and warm sunny days. As the Earth moves on its orbit to the other side, where it is tilted away from the sun during the winter, our days get shorter and shorter, and we have less daylight. God has designed living things with the ability to sense this loss of daylight, which sends a message to their brains, triggering changes in both their bodies and their behaviors. So without even trying, birds and animals instinctively know when it's time to travel and to head south in the fall. All in God's perfect timing. Fall is a season of transitions, changes, and epic journeys. And the same is true about life. We all face different transitions, changes big and small, and you never know where God is going to lead you on your epic journey. If we look at the natural world, we're reminded that we don't have to try to navigate through it all on our own. In fact, God calls us not to. In creation, we see that God helps creatures navigate by using the sun, moon, stars, and landmarks on Earth like a map to find the right way. We see that some creatures teach their young the right path to use as they grow up, and others use an internal compass to give them the right heading on their journey. Our Heavenly Father is a God who guides, not just as creatures, but more importantly, us, His children. Like a map for our journey, God has given us the Bible to show us which way to go. In Proverbs 1, 5, it says, Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. Getting guidance from God is just one reason why spending time in God's Word every day is so important.
God also gives us parents, pastors, and mentors to help teach us the way to go and the right choices to make. It's important to listen to them and remember their wisdom. And like an internal compass, God has given us the Holy Spirit that speaks to us in a still, small voice to give us our heading. God also gives us direct access to Him through prayer, where we talk to God and listen to Him. If we rely on God's guidance through reading our Bible, the leading of the Holy Spirit, and our quiet time with God in prayer, we will hear, as the prophet Isaiah said, a voice saying, this is the way, walk in it, when you turn to the right or when you turn to the left. God always knows which way we need to go. Well, I hope you had fun on our epic fall adventure today. We met some loud geese and ducks, learned about their migratory flyways, we came face to face with some large elk, watched sandhill cranes fly in to rest for the night, learned about the incredible migrations of vultures, hawks, and owls. We were reminded of how God guides us through life, and we saw how Jack Miner lived out God's calling to spread the gospel and to care for the natural world that he's given us, which is something that we've all been called to do. With so many creatures on the move, fall is the perfect season for you to go out on your own adventure. So grab your binoculars and go bird watching. Look up what areas near you might be a great place to see migration in action. So now it's your turn to hike out into creation and seek our loving creator. I'll see you next time 